I'd like us now to read from the Heidelberg Catechism. There's an insert printed in your bulletin that will make sure, if we're all reading that, that we're reading the same, uh, same translation of the Heidelberg Catechism. And at Lord's Day 32, questions and answers 86 and 87. Just would remind the congregation and those who may be visiting or listening in that we're going to be reading two documents. That is, the one, the Heidelberg Catechism. That's spirit-led. The spirit has been leading the church into all truth since the time when he was poured out. But then another one, that document called the Word of God, that's spirit-inspired and infallible. And that will be the confirmation of the truth that's in the catechism for our edification in Christian doctrine. We need to know, after all, that what we preach here is what God in Christ would say to us. So the Heidelberg Catechism uh, begins a new section, Gratitude. And you'll notice that most of the Catechism, therefore, since it's Lord's Day 32, is taken up in the subject of gratitude. Lord's Day 32. We are asked the question in this way of instruction, since then we are delivered from our misery, merely of grace through Christ, without any merit of ours, why must we still do good works? And the answer is because Christ, having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image, so that we may testify by the whole of our conduct our gratitude to God for his blessings, and that he may be praised by us, also that every one may be assured in himself of his faith by the fruits thereof, and that by our godly conversation others may be gained to Christ. And then the final question, cannot they then be saved who continuing in their wicked and ungrateful lives are not converted to God? The sobering answer is by no means. For the Holy Scripture declares that no unchaste person, idolater, adulterer, thief, covetous man, drunkard, slanderer, robber, or any such like shall inherit the kingdom of God. So there's our instruction by the Spirit-led uh, teacher of the Heidelberg Catechism. And now we go to the inspired word, 2 Corinthians 5, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and then through the first two verses of chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse, uh, beginning at verse 9 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians and want to get us up to speed, as it were, with regard to what the apostle is saying to the Corinthians in both these letters, really. Actually, the apostle is speaking to a catastrophe. The Corinthian church was a catastrophe. It was a church that was hardly a church. There were many, many problems, not the least of which was division. People saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter. Others, humbly, I'm of Christ. And all these kinds of moral problems as well, as doctrinal ones. And the apostle has his work cut out for him, as it were, as he speaks to these people and as he addresses them. Uh, but he's up for the task because he has a wonderful word, and the word is God forgives sinners. And the word is <clears throat> holiness that becomes the people of God, the right direction that they need in all of their unholiness. And in fact, holiness which unites the people of God, that is such a precious thing. As you're seeking to be holy, and I am in my corner of the world, we are united in the holiness and fellowship of God. The Apostle Paul does this so wisely. He's inspired, after all. It's the wisdom of God. And what he's been talking about at the end of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians and the beginning of chapter 5 is basically uh, the truth of the catechism. Paul's been saying, this is my comfort, 
my only comfort in life and in death. And in the grand passage, often used at funerals, in the end of chapter 4 and the early parts of chapter 5, is this acknowledgement, this confession, this confidence that I am not my own. I belong body and soul, now and forever, to Jesus Christ. That's what the apostle brings forth to these people. And he's saying, for example, that this body's a tent, we're going to put it off, and we're going to have this glorious place and position in the heaven of heavens. And what he says then in verse 8 is, is summarizes his faith. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And then verse 9 begins his therefore, his response. If this is our confidence, if our only comfort in life and in death is that we belong to Jesus, we're going to live a certain way. That's gratitude. Let's read. Therefore, because of our only comfort in life and in death, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, to God, the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we be beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. You see, there's gratitude. But for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, <clears throat> we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, in an opportune time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thus far we read God's inspired word. And now we get to see how God has led the church by the same spirit to summarize faithfully the truth, the doctrines of God's word at Lord's Day 32. <coughs> Excuse me. This, uh, by the way, will be a one cough drop sermon. I appreciate so much all the encouragement of the last two weeks in my melody and also your patience this morning. If we were to summarize the truth of all of the Bible, 
the truth of the gospel message and of the Reformed faith, we might say it is this. And you can say this to someone you meet on the street. What's the Bible about? What's the faith of the church about? It's about God and his good work. Scripture is exactly that, the revelation of God in Christ, the person of the Son of God, and his good work of salvation in Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism, the creed of the Reformed Church, representing the faith of the Church of all ages, also speaks of God and his good work. And we've been seeing that. The first 31 Lord's Days of the 52 Lord's Days, the yearly catechism of the church. We've heard right from the beginning of God and his good work, which was man in creation, the good work of God and God's image bearer. We've heard of deliverance, and we've heard a lot of that. We need to hear of our deliverance, the work of God in Christ Jesus and by his spirit, by the cross, by faith, and by grace alone. Now, in summarizing the Bible that way, we need to be very careful. The Bible is all about God and his good work. We need also to remember not to forget our good work. We need to remember the calling of each child of God to do good works that God has ordained him to do and her to do. Some have wrongly stressed good works to the point where they say good works or even faith, evangelical obedience, is necessary for salvation in the sense that we merit salvation. And it's at this point where altogether the church confesses God and his good work when people get into the good works of human beings, so the calling to believe, that's where a lot of people in churches, sadly, muck up. They mess it up. There's a problem. It's one thing to talk about God and his good work, and then how that gets to us and how we maintain, are maintained in the faith, is often presented by a large part of evangelicalism, not just uh, we're not just talking Roman Catholicism here, but by a large part of evangelicalism, it's often presented as something on which salvation depends. So we don't want to go to that extreme, as if when we talk about good works and we're going to be talking about the law and keeping the law and praying, that means that we merit something or that we might lose blessing from God if we don't measure up. But the other extreme must be avoided as well, and there are those who fall into this camp. The extreme is not talking about good works as if they were important or significant in salvation. After all, if God and his good work is the sum of the Bible, and this is the gospel in which we trust, how important can it be that we do good works? And what does it matter? That's another extreme. So in this Lord's Day, our catechism instructor, Olivianus and, and Ursinus of old, and now yours truly, would remind us to avoid extremes and to take our time a little bit as we enter into the sanctuary, the blessed place of gratitude. Remember God, that's what we want to say, and remember the calling and the privilege even the necessity, as our catechism brings out, of good works. Are you ready for that? I want to steer, in other words, in this sermon between two extremes, a whirlpool of merit and, and our thinking we can keep ourselves saved, maybe, and the rock of dead orthodoxy. I want to steer straight course right between them so that we might praise God by our good works, by faith in him and his good work in Jesus Christ. So the must of good works, that's what we want to consider. And that this is due to the nature of salvation. Salvation uh, leads us to do good works. 
And then secondly, it's for the praise of God. And finally, this is for the benefit of God's elect. So why must we do good works? That's the question I consider briefly with you this morning. The answer <clears throat> that we need to give here at this time, a very important answer, is we do good works as the result of God's good work. Understand that? It's not God over there, and we've gone through these Lord's days of deliverance, and now it's up to us, and now it's all about us. Again, we don't want to miss this. It's vital. It's vital that we remain reformed, remain biblical, and remain powerful in preaching and in living if we remember even in our good working in our life the God whose good work results in our good work. That's what the Catechism refers to when it says in answering the first question, why must we still good, do good works? The answer is this, because Christ, having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, doing work for us, also renews us by um, his Holy Spirit after his own image. You see how profound that is? The catechism here, turning the corner, entering another door of, of godliness, is reminding us not to leave the other room or maybe leave out of this next room God and his good work. And again, this God revealed in Jesus. Oh, that's how we want to preach, isn't it? And this is what we want to hear. God in Jesus, the Savior, our Redeemer, his good work of blood shedding for us sinners, his good work of receiving the gift of the Spirit, now pouring him out, lavishing himself upon us in this wonderful, holy, spiritual way, this divinity of godliness, God manifest in the flesh once and now manifest in you. Amazing. So we are renewed by the Holy Spirit, the Catechism reminds us, after his own, uh, in the spirit of Christ, by, after his own image. What does that mean? Well, it's a reference to the first work of regeneration of God upon our hearts. That's the renewal. We're born again by the spirit <clears throat> to be God's grateful people. Are you born again? Are you born again? Given a new heart, a new mind, a new will, you see, the Bible speaks of this as absolutely necessary. In fact, there's another necessity that Jesus spoke of to Nicodemus, John 3. You must be born again, he said. You must be born again. We are made new creatures in Christ, or we are old creatures in Adam. We are dead in sins, as we'll hear this evening. This renewal... For the first time is regeneration. There's a newness, as we'll refer to presently. But then there's a continual renewing. How necessary this is for our living in this nasty now and now, in this age of fake news, and when there's real news, it's bad news. We need renewal every single day. I remember waking up one morning and I was feeling healthier this past week. But I was led of the Lord to remember the psalmist praise. Your mercies are new every morning. And that morning I was given the grace to be renewed in my praise to God. Not first of all for a throat that was getting better, but for mercies new and renewed to me every morning. So, this is the work of God. That's what we need to remember. And everything we're going to be talking about, keeping the commandments, the necessity of keeping the commandments, praying, and so on, it all has to be remembered as the work of God in us in sanctifying us. And so, you see the connection. 
the work of renewal, and therefore, good works. That's the connection. Good works follow necessarily, and you'll note how in the Catechism that must is repeated again and again. Other things will be said of good works in Lord's Day 33, but here the necessity of this for reformed people, maybe especially, who emphasize the sovereignty of God. Remember the necessity of good works. And we must do good works for this reason, because we are saved. Theologically, we would say this is a reference here to the fact that sanctification, the work of holiness, follows justification necessarily. The prisoner who's declared to have the right to go free is now set free. God sets the captives free. That's what J Jesus' ministry was all about. Justification is that one-time declaration of a sinner's innocence on the basis of Christ eternally. This occurs objectively when the Son of God dies. Do you know that? When Jesus died, all those for whom he died were justified. They were principally declared to be right with God, even before they were born. Amazing. Even more amazing, I suppose, is that all the sinners before that who were God's elect and given faith in him, they too were principally justified. That's why the psalmist in one of the psalms could say, there is forgiveness with God that he may be feared. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 51, a versification of which we sang, could have confidence in the pardon of his terrible sins, in the blotting of them out, and of the joy that accompanies forgiveness. So justification, amazing gift, but sanctification too. The judge saying, let the prisoner go right now. He's mine. He's in my service. And this is so important to get these truths straight and sorted out. And before our minds, as we think about what we must do and how we're going to apply Christianity to our lives. Look at what the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. Speaking of, in a whole list of, the, uh, of uh, sinners, he says, such were, were some of you, were some of you, he's talking to these Corinthians, the first epistle, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He speaks of them in one breath, one sentence. Justification and sanctification. It's really the same uh, response to abuse of doctrine that Paul gives in Romans 6. What shall we say then, after he speak of, spoke of justification? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall it be that we're not sanctified? If we're justified freely, shall we just live the way we want? He says, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And then he goes on to say, the necessity of our not sinning and saying to ourselves, if we think we want to sin, perish the thought, the necessity is based upon our connection with Jesus, his death to sin, his life in glory and holiness, the right hand of God. So it's all about Jesus and God's work in him. That's why the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians in the chapter we read, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ and therefore justified, anyone, he is also a new creation. Old things have passed away. What are the old things? The things of sin and death and selfishness and not forgiving those who sin against you and posturing. 
The sin of pulpiteers, the sin of elders, the sin of deacons, the sin of single people, the sin of young and old, the sin of married people, the sin of parents and husbands and wives and little children and all of us. These old things have passed away if we be in Christ Jesus. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, behold, all things have become new. Why? The power of the blood. That's why power of the blood and the perfect work of salvation of the Savior who body and soul justifies sinners and sanctifies them. So that's the first point of the first point. Why do we do good works? Because of the, of the nature of the salvation of God. But then I want to say then it, it follows. Good works <clears throat> are because of the salvation we have in Christ. And they are a necessary response to that salvation. Three things about this response. Why must we do good works? You've got to be thinking about these two. As over the weeks we... dance through, no, feel our way through, no, crawl through, maybe that's closer, walk through the teaching of the holy law of God. First, our response to God's work which is God's work itself, our response, is a real response and an evidence of a real responsibility. That's the first thing we have to know. And again, maybe, first of all, as Reformed Christians who stress the sovereignty of God. We believe here the sovereignty of God. And that the whole Bible is about God and his work. Praise God, that's the good news. Because of that, we believe the responsibility of man. God made people to obey him. He created them that way. And so we are responsible. And though God is sovereign, he's the king. He does according to his will in the armies of heaven and the hosts on earth. Daniel is led to say, or Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he pleases. He makes out of nothing. He sends good and he sends calamity. He's the one who even works in the hearts of kings, Proverbs 21, to turn them whithersoever he will as the rivers of water. He's that sovereign to work over a king and to work in a king's heart. Without getting the guilt Without himself becoming the author of sin, God is not only in the mix, not only observing everything that happens, but he's God in the things that, he, that happen because these all are an execution of his eternal counsel. That's what we say, because the Bible is clear on this. Let's not lose God here. Let's not have a wimpy God here as we turn into what we ought to be doing. You see the power of the gospel preaching of the necessity of good works will come through as we're theological and Christological and soteriological, that is justification and sanctification, and as we have a mind to glory. I wax not eloquent, but too long on that point. <clears throat> we are responsible for what we do and what we don't do. <clears throat> Note, 2 Corinthians 5, the apostle of grace. We've got to follow Paul here. The apostle of election, eternal election, the sovereign double predestination of God, of, of the elect and of the reprobate. The apostle of grace, I say that again. 
who knows that by the grace of God I am what I am, he preaches here of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We're confident, body and soul, we belong to Jesus forever. And therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent from the body, to be well-pleasing to him. And here he gives the reason. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That awesome? And it's terrorizing to sinful souls, isn't it? It ought to be to sinful men who are in Adam and not in Christ. Maybe sinful men and women, boys and girls here. You are responsible, and I, are res- I am responsible. Every sinner is responsible. That's what the doctrine of good works in the Bible means. It's not insignificant, not an important. You're responsible to be a perfect husband, a perfect wife, a perfect mother, a perfect father. That's what God requires, perfection, holiness. A perfect single person, a perfect preacher, a perfect elder, a perfect deacon, a perfect child of God. You're responsible, even if you can't do it, even if you're an unbeliever. This is the the age-old slander against the Reformed faith is you believe in total depravity? How can they be held responsible, those sinners, if they can't even do what's required of them? Doesn't total inability imply complete lack of response ability? Because ability is in that word, isn't it? Responsibility is only for those who have ability. You can't have a baby in a crib be held responsible to come out of the crib and leave the house which is on fire unless you pick the baby up after all. How can it be responsible there? That's one of the hard doctrines of the Bible, isn't it? Every human being in Adam is responsible for his sin and her sin. And his sin and her sin makes him incapable of loving God. And unwilling to love God. But God still holds them responsible because they sinned in Adam. And God didn't make people Depraved, he made them good. That's the answer our catechism gives. That's maybe as far as we go. But I want to emphasize this. As believers, we are responsible and able. Our responsibility is a grace responsibility. We are made to be able, though we be far from perfect, because we are this new creation. That's something Real responsibility for which there will be judgment for us at the end of time. And even now, you're judged in your consciousness. Maybe you're being judged right now. The doctrine that Reverend Dick is preaching is just beside me. I've been inconsistent. I've been carnal. So there's judgment in your, in your conscience right now. And there will be at the judgment day. Now, the catechism, as we'll see next time, speaks of this judgment as a judgment from which we should not withdraw and hold back because we are judged in Christ. That's the beauty. This is the judgment seat of Christ here who bought us. Christ, our Redeemer, who keeps us. But there is judgment Isn't that amazing? Thanks be to God that he is responsible to keep us in salvation. But we are responsible. Second, ours is a living response. Good works are the necessary fruit of salvation. God saves, he justifies, 
and he sanctifies. Nothing can get in the way of that. And it's not one time it happened, and then maybe 20 years later you're sanctified. No, constantly you're, you're justified once, and, and now you believe in that justification's verdict is applied to you again and again as you pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and you're sanctified continually. Nothing, I say, can get in the way of that. However, we need to remember that good works are not automatic. We are not machines. We are made willing in the day of the power of God, the psalmist says. Our minds are enlightened. We choose for God, having been chosen and born again. Our hearts are made alive. Our daily experience is that we struggle. We struggle against evil, and we struggle to do what's right. And so this response is not only a real response, but it's a living response. Third, it's a loving response, and I want to end this point with that. Ours is a loving response, and this is what I want to emphasize throughout the series on gratitude. You love God. You know the love of God to you. Well, that's got to be at the heart of our obedience, doesn't it? Look how it was for Paul. In verse 14, 13, he says, If we be beside <coughs> excuse me, ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us, constrains us, moves us. Think of Paul, persecutor of Jesus. That's what Jesus said to him. He's persecuting the church. Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In persecuting the body of Christ, you're persecuting the head. The devil can't get at the head, he gets at the body, the church of Jesus Christ. And Paul was of that nation, you remember, that crucified the Lord, the Prince of Glory. They rejected the only Savior. And Paul led the way then in blotting out any kind of vestige of the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus in the church by killing and hauling off to prison the Christians of the first century. Paul loved God for saving him. He's an example to us. Now, I know he's an apostle, one of the foundation, part of the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. But Paul is, what a man but it's an example to us that we might be men for once. Men and women for once. Women and godly children and godly church members, godly citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Paul was loved and saved and justified and sanctified, and he preached the gospel and he would spend and be spent, and he would die for the cause of Jesus Christ. How about we ourselves? How about we ourselves? Paul would write to Titus chapter 2. We are redeemed by the blood. The grace of God has appeared. We're redeemed and renewed by the blood of Jesus Christ that we might be a people zealous for good works. That we might be a thankful people. Paul leads the way in thankfulness. By the grace of God, I am what I am. He had a thorn in his side. He prayed three times it might be taken away and he was taught to be content. And now he communicates that to us. Contentment, which leads to gratitude. Away with the grumpiness because we're grateful. Away with the cloudy day countenance because the sun reigns in heaven and he's shining down upon us. Away with the inconsistencies and the compromises because you're loved to love God back. For praise, a second point. <clears throat> the renewed and thankful creature is a recreation of God to his praise. 
Now that's because as often as we show that we are not ourselves and we belong to Jesus, we're showing the good work of God. We're showing that there is a God. Have you had that in your homes or in family and friends? Maybe after a while in your life, whenever it came to be, God worked in you to be more serious about the Christian faith. Have your family and your friends, your old acquaintances, noted the difference? The maturity, the willingness to do what you before would not do, the unwillingness to cavort in sinful things as you did before. We are God's. And we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. And the Belgian Confession reminds us, we are beholden to God for the good works we do, and not he to us, since it is he that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we show of God. As we are this people acting as the people formed for his praise, the new creation, we are showing off the greatness and the glories of God who makes a difference, not only, but it's a, a new creation difference. Imagine, and we have imaginations, by the way, as image bearers, not wild ones, but imaginations that make for us to be on the behalf of God as creative. That's what imaginations are. A poet imagines things and saying and expressing things, and an artist does. In a way, all Christians are real Christians, are not imaginary Christians, but they have this imagination that imagines the world full of glory when there was decadence that is in the midst of something that's seen because this is of believers is the is of faith and heaven come down and earth come up. Imagine you were at creation and God was saying, let there be light. Now, of course, I speak as a fool a reverent fool, though, couldn't have been there till the sixth day. But imagine you were there, an angel, and beholding the work of God. Let there be light. Let there be stone. Let there be mountain. Let there be seas. Let there be the sun in the heavens and the moon and the stars. And all, <coughs> excuse me, out of nothing. Amazing. And you're beholding it all, and it's new. It, it wasn't there, and now it is. And God is here now because there's out of this chaos this wonderful, wise God with great purposes and plans and unimaginable greatness. Well, that's something that people see in us and that we are to see in one another a creation out of nothing, out of death, out of old habits, ways of looking at things, something new and great. That's God. In addition to that, all these good works of gratitude show the holiness of God. The good works we do that are necessary are necessary that we show off the value of Christ's atonement. He died and not in vain. The good works we do show the unity of the Godhead, God the Father in our creation, God the Son in our redemption, and God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. They're all one. We are Trinitarian believers, and when you do good works, it shows the work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the absolutely perfect work, and none the least of the glories of God that are shown off when you do good works is the glory of His grace and free kindness. This for the praise of God. 
the Apostle Paul in conclusion to his statement that he's confident that he belongs to Jesus, body and soul. Verse 8 says, therefore, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to God. We make it our aim. Do you make the praise of God your aim? That's, that's the question. Are you coming into the sanctuary of gratitude, holding back? Because there's some bad work you just don't want to let go and stop. Some grudge you're holding that you just don't want to let go. It's not safe to forgive. It's not safe to stand out. How about you? Final point for God's elect. <clears throat> Catechism reminds us that for those who are converted, we're given assurance as we walk in the good works we are ordained to do. That's a very blessed thing. Puritans used to say that this was this practical way that we could know that we are God's, and it is indeed. By their fruits you shall know them, that is, false prophets, and also true prophets, but also, in a way, by our fruits we shall know ourselves. As we walk the talk, God confirms to our hearts that we're his, and that we're his forever. How about that? There's a warning here, and the Catechism reminds us that those continuing in wicked and ungrateful lives cannot be saved. They're not converted to God. And I'm not talking just about being converted so they don't drink wine anymore or smoke anymore or have this bad habit of whistling in the classroom like I used to have. But we're talking conversion of a person and a daily change and renewal of God. Such who are not, who don't care to be, who don't listen to those who tell them and warn them of their sin, they are warned here, and we are warned here, to examine ourselves and see whether we be in the faith. I brought out 2 Corinthians 5 and 6, because I want to point you to the problem at Corinth. Do you understand here what's going on? I'm not quite sure I do, except I know there was a problem, even a catastrophic spiritual problem at Corinth. They were not acting as spiritual. They were acting carnal. <clears throat> and so Paul has just spoken, for example, in verse uh, 18, or, uh, yes, verse 18, that... God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and speaks of this reconciliation in verse 19. But then, Paul says in verse 20, to these people of whom it's just said they've been reconciled, he says to them, we <coughs> excuse me, plead, and God through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The reconciled are called to be reconciled. How does that fit? I'm not sure I understand this totally, except that Paul is addressing an appearance of ungodliness, a glaring inconsistency among the people who confess to be reconciled. The truth is, we believe that all who confess and who are really uh, God's people are reconciled by the blood of the Lamb. Good works is the way that we show it. And among the Corinthians, there were those who were confessing Christ and confessing grace. And wonder of wonders, chapter 6, verse 1, they had to be pleaded with not to receive the grace of God in vain. In an empty way, they were being warned here and sobered by the judgment to come. 
and reminded urgently that now was the acceptable time, drawing from the Old Testament psalmist, the time of opportunity to repent, lest you be hardened. And you see, this is what happens in the congregational setting, especially. Yes, sinners outside are hardened, but those who hear the gospel of what God is and what God does, and now of the good works to which we're called to do and that are necessary, and they do not believe, these ones are hardened most of all, and judgment, Isaiah reminds us, begins at the house of God. So this is what we had to remember as we consider these good works and the urgency of our doing them for God's praise. But finally, I want to encourage us all. You're hearing this, and maybe this will keep you home. Because, oh man, he's going to just preach it like it is in the Bible. And those commandments are <clears throat> very severe. I blow it all the time. And I don't want to go to church just to get hammered. In fact, every time I try to do good works... I get laughed at, persecuted maybe. It's hard. And it doesn't come natural. And even our good works are nothing in the sense of meriting anything before God. They're imperfect. I want to remind you of the encouragement of the preacher. This is what Jesus came for. Isaiah 61, our call to worship. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of jubilee of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God those who would do good works. To them he comes and says, I comfort all you who mourn because your works are far from perfect. I want to console you who mourn in Zion and give all of those beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You see, so that you can remember again that it's not just about you and your lonesome and your efforts and your strugglings. It's about God with you and in you and picking you up when you fall down. And so you can be happy. And that you can be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. We've heard of the good work of God and the good works of God through us. Let us press on. Amen. Father, we pray that you would bless us and comfort us with the word of God that we want to hear echoes of now so it drop not to the ground and be nothing to us. God, speak powerfully, continually. Now as we part from this place of worship, speak with one another, catechize and are catechized. God help us to be those glad to serve you, to praise you, glad that through our good works we ourselves can be helped and others converted to Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.